Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Bose metal. Uh, I want to thank the, it's a great privilege to be part of this conference honoring Kosterlitz and Thaulis and Haldane. Um, for 10 years in the uh, late 80s, no, sorry, late, yeah, the mid 90s to the early 2000s, I essentially worked on Kosterlitz Thaulis physics. And that's what I'm going to tell you about. And then I quit working on the problem. And now I've gotten lost in black holes and all of this. Um, but this problem isn't going away. And I just want to give you a progress report on where the problem is right now. So the problem is the, that I'm, I, what I want to uh, argue is that Bose metals disrupt the costerless thalus transition in thin films. And this is a rather generic effect. And uh, uh, we, have we have a theory for this. And uh, as far as I can tell, it's the only one that seems to explain the experiments which keep coming out. Doesn't mean it's right, just means it's, still, it's, a, it's a contender. OK, so this problem came about around 19, uh, the late 80s. And it was in the midst of. Uh, this major paradigm in solid state physics that the beta function in d equals 2 and less is a never changes sign, and hence you can only have one state. And that state would be the insulating state. So it's an absence of metallic states in two dimensions. Uh, in 19, uh, it's, as I said, in the mid 90s, these results started becoming more prolific. So over here is a silicon MOSFET. And what they did is they simply increased the density, starting from a rather dilute system. This is almost a Wigner crystal. And then, as you see, the resistivity as a function of temperature diverges. Uh, so this is exactly the insulating state. But over here, it, go, it turns downwards. And it's this turning downwards that indicates you possibly have a metallic state. And um, this problem is uh, certainly unresolved as is this one. Here you have uh, films which, su which superconduct. And you'll see the superconductivity is, is, is the, is the uh, thalus transition. And then there's one curve that's, in that's, in that's entirely flat. This is the critical regime. And then you go into the insulator. So, and this is around 1989. This is Goldman's data. OK, so this is what I'm going to focus on. So the insulator superconductor transition in thin films. And what's very nice about this data is that the resistivity right at criticality is exactly the resistance for charge 2E excitations. So it's magically 6.54 kilo ohms. OK, so everyone became very excited by this superconductor to insulator transition. It's very easy to understand, not very easy, but there's a model which one can write down which captures what's going on here. OK, now uh, Art Hebbard, uh, is he here? Okay, I don't think he's here. But Art Hebbard also had similar data on indium oxide. OK. Hmm? OK, could you just hold on for a few minutes? I am presenting this story as if it's resolved. But as you'll see, it's far from resolved. In fact, this is one of the things which shows that this story is not correct. OK. Yeah, yeah I know. This picture is in my book. <laughs> yes, that's right. This is in my book. <laughs> OK. OK. So the model which was written down to explain this is a phase-only model. OK, so the transition occurs by either changing the thickness of the film, so increasing the disorder, or, um, or applying a magnetic field. Let's assume both of these are the same. OK, so 
It's a phase-only model. And this term is the one that maximizes phase coherence. This kinetic energy term of the phase destroys phase coherence. OK, so you have these two terms, and they compete with one another. Hence, there should be a, a phase transition in which this term dominates, and then this one takes over. OK, and it's because there's a duality between part, the number and the phase. And the critical value should be roughly EC, EC over J. OK, so it, on this side of the phase diagram, this quantity, the particle number, is a definite value. Whereas over here, it's completely randomized, and the phase acquires a particular value. So if, in fact, you can see these two uh, competing tendencies, there's essential tension between phase ordering and, and uh, particle number ordering, uh, there has to be a phase transition. And this was pointed out. Um, well, certainly the one who gets all the credit is Matthew Fisher. And uh, this vortex particle duality uh, led the way as the leading explanation for the superconductor insulator transition. And uh, this is a nice picture of what's going on here. On this side, we have, uh, well, on, in the superfluid state, we have well-defined phase, whereas on the insulator, we have well-defined particle. So this is associated with this. This is associated with that. OK, so let's just ask a more general question. OK, you have an insulated superconductor transition that's governed by phase-only physics. And let's say that's the whole story. What are the values you could possibly get for the resistivity? OK, so, so let me just plot the resistivity with this number varying. OK, and right here we have a critical point. OK, so on the um, insulating side, this number is infinite, so the resistivity is infinite, the conductivity is 0. And over here, this number is 0, and the resistivity goes to 0, and you have a superconducting state. Within this model, what you expect is that at criticality, bosons on the brink of localizing should just be characterized by one particular value for the resistance. And um, that's h over 4e squared. OK, so this was the story. And right at the critical point, there's, of course, an anomalous dimension. And I'm giving a talk next week at NUS entirely about anomalous dimensions. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to mention anything today, but I just want to remind you that there is an anomalous dimension right here. OK, so does this theory really work? Okay, as someone pointed out, what is your name? No, what is your name? Yours, the guy you pointed this out. What? What is your name? It's a simple question. Should he try? Oh, okay, you pointed out, <laughs> okay, that, um, that, that the value for the resistivity at criticality can in fact change. So I think what you did is you read my book. And in fact, this picture is in my book. OK? And uh, in, all, in these films, th these numbers vary all over the place. In molybdenum germanium, the numbers are considerably smaller than h over 4e squared. And for bismuth, they're greater. OK, for one sample, in one material, you find h over 4e squared. OK, now if it's not h over 4e squared, then uh, we can't really understand this as, a, as generic physics from this phase-only model. OK. So is a metallic phase for bosons possible? OK, so if it's not h over 4 squared, it means bosons can have any particular value. OK, so let's look at the data. OK, so this is going to be my time axis. <laughs> OK. So in 1989, it was reported that, in fact, the resistivities, as you uh, decrease the, the thickness of the sample, uh, so it became more, more dis actually, yes, yeah, you increase the thickness of the sample, so it became uh, less disordered. Some of these resistivity curves, which were vanishing, in fact, started to plateau. And this, this persisted. So this is Alan Goldman's data in 1989. Um, this is from the Kapitolnik group at Stanford. And there are several PhD pieces uh, that were written on this work. 
okay? And that's where the field was in the 90s, and that's when I was heavily involved in this problem. And then this has persisted to even today. Okay, last year in a Nature uh, physics paper, and that's how I got involved in this problem again, um, this is on niobium diselenide, something very simple. Nothing is like you know, these samples. You see that as you increase the, the magnetic field indicated here, the resistivity tends to plateau. And it's this plateauing of the resistivity that indicates that possibly this is not a simple problem of just phase-only physics giving you a critical point and the resistivity being h over 4e squared. OK. Now, one of the questions that always arose with this leveling off of the resistivity is that, is this just a failure to cool the electrons? So one of the things they did in this paper, which was done in the earlier papers as well, but now it's 2016, uh, so we have to take this seriously. What they did is, OK, this pointer is, has faded. Is there? Does this one have a pointer? It's red. OK. 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 Thanks. OK, so what they did is they asked the question, if in fact this may be a, a failure to cool the electrons, what they did is they, they said that this activated part matches exactly what you'd expect from the KT transition. But then as they increased the magnetic field, what they found is that the deviation from the activated behavior didn't always occur at the same temperature. In fact, as you increase the field, the region in which the resistivity tends to level tends to exist over a wider range. It goes to lower temperature. If the, if the electrons weren't cooling, they would just always, this behavior would deviate at the same temperature. It would not be dependent on the value of the field. OK, and in fact, this had been observed earlier by Kapitulnik. Um, here he sees that, in fact, um, you know, this is the region where he has the, 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 the true superconductor, and this is where the resistivity turns on. And it's, it's this regime right here that he is plotting. OK, so from this data and, and this data set in 2016, it's clear that you can't attribute, you can't just dismiss this data or these data as just a failure to cool the electrons, which was always the criticism of Alan Goldman's original data. OK, so it's not a, refriger it's not a refrigeration artifact. OK, so it seems, and the fields at which this is occurring are way below HC2. So if it's way below HC2, the basic excitations then are still Cooper pairs. Within the phase-only model, the only two values you can have for the resistivity are either it's uh, 0, so the resistivity, you're in the superconducting state, or it's infinite, you're in the insulating state. OK, so the question is, uh, does a Bose metal exist? And if so, how would you think about formulating a theory for it? And do the predictions of this theory have anything to do with what is seen experimentally? Now, one of the key predictions experimentally, and this came out of this Nature Physics paper in 2016, but it was actually there in the 89 data of Goldman and also in the data of uh, Kapitulnik. Um, that the resistivity turns on continuously from zero as a power law. And this is the uh, field, HSM is the uh, field at which you see the superconductor to metal transition. 
And this, this field, HSM, is much smaller than HC2. OK, so what we're looking for then is over a fairly wide range of, of, uh, of in parameter space of the coupling constant, uh, can you get a resistivity that looks like this? OK, now this has uh, led to various kinds of proposals for phase diagrams that uh, in the insulator superconductor transition, there's actually another axis here. And this axis was called dissipation or coupling to the environment. There are other degrees of freedom, which in fact are leading to this deviation from the phase-only picture. OK, now what I want to do is just give you an analogy. We know from just looking at the Bose-Hubbard model, sort of like the finite uh, number limit of the phase-only model, so when the number of particles is really small. Um, if you have disorder, you cannot go directly from the Mott insulator into a superfluid. There's an intervening phase here, which is a Bose glass, which is, in fact, a metallic phase. So the question I want to ask is, does the same thing, so these are the three phase diagrams they, uh, they, they wrote down. All the evidence seems to be from all numerical simulations and RG that, in fact, you, this, that this one, is the, that this one wins. Uh, you go from the Mott insulator to Bose glass to a superfluid. And there's an, interme there's an intervening phase. Yes. Yes, that's right. Right, 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 right. Right, OK, so it, in this problem, there's an, intervening, there's an intervening phase. OK, so in this problem, it seems that when you destroy the superconductor, and it's a costless thallus, so all of its properties are well documented to be costless thallus. When you destroy that phase, it seems like what comes about is not an insulator, but something that still has Cooper pairs, and it has a finite conductivity. And this talk is about uh, what is that phase, or how would you understand that phase? OK, now, many experimentalists at the time uh, in neighboring fields, remember, this was, the, this, was, this was in the day of the vortex glass being a major paradigm. Chris Lobb, who I think is here. Is Chris Lobb here? He was here. OK. He's, he's coming? Again, by <laughs> OK. The virtual Chris Lobb um, had, had argued extensively that the, ev the experimental evidence for the, uh, for the vortex glass phase being a superconductor was minimal. Because if you look at, this, if you look at these, these uh, data and you scale them, you can, all, you can always scale them in the form of these power laws that were proposed. But then he argued that this scaling uh, could vary extensively, and hence the existence of scaling is not, has nothing to do with whether or not there is a true zero resistance state. And as far as he could tell from the strenuous tests that he would say have to be present, the somewhat system has to pass, for you to say that there is a zero resistance state, none of the experimental systems pass that test. So I want to put this in the background that this is also, that any conclusion we reach affects also this more general problem. OK, so is a Bose metal possible? So what we need to do is go and compute the conductivity of a boson of a model in which the basic excitations are bosons. And we need to do so in the proper order of limits. We need to look, work in the collision-dominated regime. Sabir taught us how to do this. Uh, we take the limit in which frequency is, is 0 first, and then we take the limit that uh, t goes to 0. So we have to work in the, the regime in which it's the, uh, it's the thermal excitations of the order parameter which govern the relaxation of the system. There was a lot of debate earlier on in the 80s in which people were getting conflicting results because they had done the opposite. 
we know now this is the correct thing to do. So I'm not going to review this any further. Uh, all the results I will present were derived with this order of limits. Okay, so the first thing to do is just look at this model. Um, the, this phase-only model, and uh, I will just want to ask the question, so m is going to be sort of the mass which is generated here, m is less than t, and this is the costless Taoist line. In this uh, critical regime, m is proportional to t, and here m is much bigger than t. So this is the gapped uh, insulating phase, this is the superconducting phase. I just want to ask, ask a question. We know what, the, what their conductivity is here. What is the conductivity over here? This is the metallic, this is, sorry, this is the insulating phase. So it should be zero. Okay, so let's just verify that it's zero. Okay, uh, you might think, why am I doing this? Uh, well, because I've noticed that any time you approach a problem, you, you might as well go and establish the results which everyone thinks are correct. And if you get them, then fine. If you don't, then you've, you have learned something. Okay, so what is the conductivity over here? So we went and did this, and here's the result we found. Okay, and it's a fairly simple result. If you're, if you're worrying about things which are thermally excited, the number of them is uh, exponentially small in this mass. Um, but if these are the only thing that is relaxing the, uh, the momentum, then this relaxation time is exponentially long. Your conductivity is just the product of the two. And hence, your conductivity is, in fact, of order one. And uh, you can work out the exact coefficient, and it's this quantity right here. OK, so the insulator is actually a metal. Okay, no one believed this result when we, we derived it. Um, but in fact, the result is correct. And um, it wasn't until Green and uh, what, is your, what is your colleague's name? Yeah, Andrew Green, who do you work with? Sandy, Sandy, sorry, sorry. Okay. Green and Sandy actually worked out um, the finite frequency conductivity in a similar model. And in fact, they found that there was a conductivity that was on the, quote, insulating side. And it's just Schwinger pair production. So once they derived that result, then, which was like seven years later, then our results sort of became uh, accepted. But it, it's sort of obvious, right? Um, it, it's, just a, it's just a matter of the fact that you have these two things that are sort of going in opposite directions, right? One is exponentially sm small, the other one's exponentially long, and uh, it's the product of them, and there's just something finite. Yeah, yeah, this is true in any dimension. Yeah, yeah, this is independent. In fact, do you remember Patrick Lee's paper on the sort of uh, the conductivity along the nodes? He, he got this universal conductivity. It's the same mechanism, and Fratkin had an earlier result. OK, so we, OK. Uh, we derived this in two dimensions, and I, uh, so I learned not to make any speculations, okay? Uh, we, I can only say what we did. So that's what we did, and that's the answer. Okay, okay, but this result is irrelevant, and here's the reason why. Uh, the insulator is a, is a metal, but it's a very fragile metal. If you add anything to it, uh, this result goes away. So nothing's perfect. So. Um, this metal is not, and plus it's only at one particular value of the coupling constant, so it's not, it's sort of irrelevant. It's a curious sort of result, but um, it, it doesn't give you what we are looking for. Namely, over a wide range of coupling constants, you see a metallic phase in which the, resist, the conductivity or the resistivity turns on uh, algebraically. Okay, so you have to be in the uh, you have to be in the metallic sorry you have to be in the insulating phase. It, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's not a particular value. Yeah, it, it's just everywhere to the right. Sorry, sorry. Yes, 
as I was saying, I was realizing, no, that's, that's not right. Okay, right. Everywhere to the right. Um, you know, I've learned not to make speculations, so I, I don't know, okay? Because I would have thought this result wouldn't be true, and uh, it was, here it is, okay? I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, so the, then if you add this on, the conductivity does go to zero. Why is it a universal number? Because it can't depend on any of the details, because it's just scattering with this exponentially small thing and the collisions between them uh, are just governed by this relaxation time that's exponentially long. So what, what, what system parameters would it depend on other than, okay, that's, that's not in the model, it's just this G, uh, it's just ECJ model and it's just once you're beyond the, once you're in the insulating phase, I think it only depends on things like pi. Well, we showed it's the case, <laughs> okay? We showed it's the case. Uh, and, and in retrospect, I would say, um, I, I don't see what else it could depend on, but you know, my intuition is not the reason why this result exists. We calculated it, yes? Absolutely, okay? So we, we worked all of that out, and because of how uh, the, the boson uh, parameters come in, it, it absolutely, the simple argument captures the physics. So you just work out the collision integrals in the Boltzmann equation, and you know, there it is. Okay. Okay, so then, in the mid-90s, with this severe Sachdev collision-dominated machinery, we sort of took this and started applying it to all the possible models in search of a Bose metal. Okay, and the first thing that you would do is you would add in dissipation because you know, that's what the smart people said. Uh, add in some sort of ohmic dissipation. And if you just Google ohmic dissipation, you get this model <laughs> and, uh, and with this thing given by uh, this thing here, this mod omega. So you're changing from z equals one dynamics to z equals two dynamics. And this is, so yeah, you, you just get a huge number of hits. And a lot of people, including Mr. Our esteemed speaker, Rosario Fazio, right? Uh, he worked on this model. And uh, a lot of people did. It was the model to work on. And um, uh, here are the results, okay? So if you're trying to calculate the conductivity, but so a lot of those calculations had to be dismissed because they were not in the collision dominated regime. In other words, omega and t going to zero limits had been reversed. So we sort of were the first to apply this collision-dominated uh, regime to this, to this particular model. Okay, here's some sort of uh, details which uh, just help you set up the calculation. You can reduce the conductivity to a bunch of integrals which look like this. Those things are governed by these expressions. And if you go and calculate the conductivity, it reduces to this integral, okay? Now, this integral has a very simple form in a particular regime, okay? Uh, it takes on this particular form in this, when m dominates over eta over k, eta is the magnitude of the dissipation. Uh, so once again, it's in the large m regime, okay? So we're in the quantum disordered regime. And, um, uh, uh, but it's still, you'll see, in sort of large temperatures. Okay, now M does depend on temperature, this, this mass that is sort of governed by the renormalizations in the system. Okay, and uh, here it is. If you include the interactions, M goes with KT and this exponential right here. So now if you just stick this in to this expression, um, you stick this in, this in right here, you find that the conductivity does in fact have a temperature independent part. So in the large mass regime, you do find that there's a plateau, okay? And this plateau then would tell you that uh, perhaps then there is a metallic state, okay? Okay, um, 
but not so fast, because remember, we didn't really set the temperature to, to zero. If we now let the temperature be the smallest of these parameters, the conductivity diverges uh, exponentially, and hence, this also is not the answer. OK, but we didn't give up. We kept trying to construct metallic phases out of bosons. Um, so dissipation alone is not enough. So if you just go and solve that standard model with mod omega with, you know, for bosons, you don't end up with anything other than two phases, an insulator and a superconductor. OK, so then we decided to add, to add disorder. OK, so we added disorder because we knew we could generate more phases. OK? And in fact, we could end up with a glassy phase, this phase glass, or what others have called a gauge glass. OK? And so there's some details of how you go and do all of these calculations. Absolutely. That's fine. That's fine. It, it, so you know, the magnetic field is then right up. Yeah. It's absolutely equivalent to this model. OK? OK. OK. So um, yeah. Uh, uh, so the Edwards-Anderson order parameter is defined right here, A and B are the replicate indices. This kernel is, uh, has a very interesting uh, field de I'm sorry, frequency dependence. So we have two order parameters. The glass and the super and the bosonic or superconducting order parameter, and the these two order parameters are coupled. Okay, so this thing right here is just the spin glass part, and this is now how the bosons talk to the glassy excitations. So I want to consider the, this part of the problem: bosons moving in a glassy environment. There's a new term right here. Okay, now this order parameter in frequency space looks like this. There's a mod omega. This is the replica diagonal part, and there's a replica off-diagonal part. OK. Um, so, and this, in fact, gives you z equals to two dynamics. OK, so this is the problem. This part has been solved before, and it doesn't give you anything interesting. Uh, this is the new part. At zero frequency, you have this part, which is replica off-diagonal and it's linearly proportional to the Edwards-Anderson order parameter. OK. And uh, the green function here is just this. You can do it, derive it, and it now has this g squared term, but only at zero frequency. So now it's a very simple problem. Go and calculate the conductivity with this propagator. OK. And we went and did that. And this is the conductivity with this order of limits. Omega z is equal to 0, t then going to 0. You end up generically with a metallic phase. And the metallic phase is very interesting because it's, it's over a wide range, and uh, it scales as a power law. In fact, if you just put in this as the coupling, the deviation from the critical point, it just goes as g minus gc to minus 2z nu. Okay? So we have a, a metallic phase of bosons over a fairly wide range. Okay, and the experiments give us this. They just give you one value. They haven't really determined what z is. They give you the, so it would be interesting to then go and independently determine z or infer that from another measurement. OK. So one of the questions that always came up with this is that is this phase glass stiff? Is it still a superconductor? OK. So um, if it is, then everything I told you is irrelevant because that order will win out. And uh, I will still have to worry about how those excitations, what their contribution is to the overall conductivity. OK, so here is the, um, so the, the basic argument is, is the, does the free energy scale in this form? OK, so what you really are looking at is the following. It's really an energy landscape problem. We have these bosons moving around in a glassy landscape. If they stay in one well, then the, the stiffness will be well-defined. In fact, it will be non-zero. Um, but if, in fact, they start exploring this energy landscape, they take an infinite amount of time to find the ground state, and hence the conductivity will be finite. Because it, it's, a, it's a similar argument with this order of limits. But here, it's sort of the fact that bosons in this glassy landscape sort of never, they sort of diffuse forever because they're always trying to find the overall, mi the overall minimum. OK. Now, 
you can formulate this problem more exactly. Okay, you can ask the question, is there a stiffness? And you can calculate the energy for creating a defect in the system, okay? And if this energy is, if this quantity is positive, if it's non-zero, then there is a stiffness. So it really the, it matters whether or not this exponent here is, uh, sort of came in the wrong order. Okay, so here it is. Okay, so there have been computer simulations of this in 2D, not in, well, they're also done in 3D, but the relevant one here is 2D. And in fact, this exponent is negative in 2D. And in fact, there were calculations done by uh, our guest, and he also got the same result. Okay, in fact, do you remember this paper? <laughs> okay, okay, so I made sure I showed it to, so, so, right, okay, so once again, theta is negative. So the conclusion then is this glassy phase in 2D is not a superconductor. In 3D, it is. Okay, so then I, I and then I, I go back to this question that Chris Lobb was trying to ask. Uh, this also implies things about the vortex glass state. Uh, I would say that experimentally and theoretically, I don't see any other answer, answer but no. It is, it is not a superconductor. Okay, so I would say that this model captures uh, the turn on of the resistivity. Uh, and it says that the basic excitation, the basic uh, underlying physics is the physics of this, these glassy excitations. Okay, so theory and experiments seem to indicate yes. Uh, now, what is the value of z? Okay, we say that z is equal to two. Now, if it's z is equal to two, this means this underlying system is now particle hole symmetric. Okay, so is there any evidence for that experimentally? So this Bose metal would be a phase in which if you were to measure uh, the rho x x, this would be non-zero, it would be finite, but if you were to measure the Hall coefficient, for example, that would be zero. Okay, so Aaron Kapitolik sent me this data last night, and here it is, okay? So he's done this measurement, and the Hall resistivity in the Bose metal phase, this phase right here and right here, this pointer is dead, uh, is in fact zero. Okay, so then he has argued that in fact the correct phase diagram for this system, here is the famed uh, costulus thiolus line over here, but what disrupts the superconductor is a metallic phase in which rho xy is equal to zero. So there's the emergence of particle hole symmetry. Now you, you can't really argue that you know, this thing is equal to zero, that, um, that um, the reason why this is, 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 is seeing a non-zero rho x x uh, is the system is still, it still has a failure to cool because you're seeing a zero rho x y. So your similar arguments will also have to apply there. So I, I think we might be at a, at a state in this pro stage in this problem where we have to start taking the experiments seriously and they seem to indicate that in generically, that generically, when you destroy a superconductor in two dimensions, you seem to end up with a, with a phase that is particle hole symmetric and it has a finite conductivity, way below HC2, and hence it has to be a Bose metal. Okay, I think this is it. going on the glassy phase, how the glassy phase is generated for this problem. Kindly explain me again. Okay, so um, the glassy phase enters from the fact that Jij, is, it's a disorder effect. Okay, so um, what, and Jij can have different signs. What Kivelson and Spivak showed in, I forgot when in the 90s they showed this, if you look at a, gen a, a general model for bosons in the presence of disorder, they will, have they will have random Js just from the disorder. 
So anytime you have a model with disordered bosons, I mean with an underlying substrate that is disordered, you have to consider a model with random JIJs. Now near the tricritical point between the superconductor, the Bose, uh, the, sorry, the, um, the glass and the paramagnet, um, you have to worry about the coupling between all of these order parameters. So I'm saying that in the vicinity of that, there is a coupling between the bosonic degrees of freedom and the glassy degrees of freedom, and uh, uh, that is the, and that gives you this model which you can solve that gives you this conductivity. Agreed, or your calculation agrees with the experiment only in the, as you said, pointed out, collision dominated regime. Have any implication for uh, any experimentally relevant range of parameters, or is it just a technical? Um, I mean, is that, is, is right, that a Right, so in all of the experiments, certainly the, temp the, the frequencies that are used to go and measure the, AC, the, the DC conductivity, in fact, are smaller um, than the temperature. Okay, so, okay, now in the opposite regime, if you're doing an AC result, uh, I don't know what you would get. We have not developed the machinery to, to, to go and do that. That might be an interesting, that would give you more information about this Bose glass, I mean, I'm sorry, about this uh, metallic phase. And that might be an interesting thing to do, but I, we have not done that. There's no relation with the, the level of disorder in the system at all, right? Um, you mean the AC response? Uh, or, or, yeah, just, well, well, or how much the system is dominated by the collisions as opposed to, yes. okay. Uh, yeah, I would just say that the more disordered it is, the more it's, well, uh, you don't need to make predictions because they can always be wrong. I, I, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, could I ask you about the, the zero temperature limit in your purple phase? Yes. Have you, have you got a picture of what the ground state is like? With the what? The ground state. Yeah, um, so, right. So the ground state would be bosons moving in. So I think this is related to your question. You're saying, what is glassy about the system if, in fact, it is the bosons which are moving? OK. The fact that you're still coupling so the, whatever is the superfluid still has to couple to the fact that you can still form a, a glass near this transition point, okay? So as long as you have a non-zero Edwards-Anderson order parameter and you still have superconducting fluctuations, you still have to couple them. Okay, so the ground state is, this is inherently glassy. So I would argue there should be some sort of hysteresis here. And um, it's uh, you know, bosons trying to find the minimum state. And they sort of can't do that on any finite length scale and time scale. And that's why their conductivity is still finite. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, on your a alpha metal, is rho XX bigger than it is in the weak insulator metal, insulator? Rho XX is non-zero. Hello, yes. Yes, oh, yeah. it, is this it? is, no, this is much bigger than this. That's much bigger. Yeah, 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 because remember, so, these curves come down, they level off, yeah. and they start creeping up, and then finally they start diverging. And that's this insulator state, this insulating state. OK. OK. So you first in these hydrographs, so why would you expect to get a, a, a rho x, y equals 0 to a non-zero boundary? I mean, on symmetry grounds, I don't see why rho x, y should be, could be strictly 0 when rho x, x is not. Well, you've applied a magnetic field. Sorry? Sorry? You've applied a magnetic field. So you broke the time reverse. Yeah. But you're finding that, so he, he applies a magnetic field, measures rho x, y, and finds it at zero. So which means there has to be particle hole symmetry in the, in the problem, if it's zero. 
I mean, you have a metal, right? You apply a you apply a magnetic field, you generate a Hall coefficient. Mm -hmm. Why am I So the question is, uh, if if time reversal is broken, why would you expect to get a case with rho x y strictly zero? Okay, that's my okay, okay. That's your question. His question is, if you've applied a magnetic field, and uh, um, you've broken time reversal symmetry, why should rho x y equal zero? Okay. That's the question. So then, the, then his statement then, his experimental statement, is the only way that could be understood is if this metallic phase has particle hole symmetry. That's, a, that's, a, that's the title of the paper, Emergence of Particle Hole Symmetry in the Metallic Phase. So it's a new signature of it. If you have z equals 2 dynamics for bosons, that's particle hole symmetry. So I think this is an indirect measure of what Z is. Hello. They're back there. Hello. Uh, yeah. So in the, the um, so you have this coupling J, I, J? Yes. Yeah, so these are like, this can be negative or positive? They can be negative or positive. So without magnetic field? Without a magnetic field. How it, can it be? See, that, that's what, okay, that, that's what Spivak and Kivelson showed. Uh, um, so just look at, it, 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 you know, bosons hopping on and off a grain, going through an impurity uh, that doesn't have any magnetic structure. That's what they showed. And they, he, they showed, in fact, that the, the, the sign of, just go and do perturbation theory, the sign of J can even, can, can in fact change. But if there is, I mean, no magnetic field of spin orbit coupling, then how, how, how can I imagine that two boson will have less energy if they're like antiphase, if the, if the J is negative? Okay, um, look, I don't remember exactly the, ex the exact D. No, no, but so w what we did is we in fact put in a non-zero mean in the problem because we wanted to look at a, uh, a, a, uh, an ordered phase, okay? But the tail can, in fact, go into negative values, okay? So the original model studied by Reed and Sachdev was one in which you just had different signs for Jij. And what we wanted to study was the tricritical point. So uh, in the early, uh, in your early slides, you showed a uh, Bose metal uh, appearing in zero fi magnetic field, uh, very low temperature. This was yeah, the, by, uh, the by changing the the disorder, the the, 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 the thickness of the samples. Yeah. Exactly. So by scaling the disorder. So yeah. my question is, what, if anything, is the link between HM1 in those data and okay. this critical disorder uh, okay. which you need? Okay. So what my my statement then is. Um, just treat this as a coupling constant G, whether it's the thickness which governs the disorder or this governing the, the magnetic field, the results seem to be identical. Okay, now, okay, okay, so, but of course there's disorder in all of these problems. Okay, so I'm just treating that as the coupling constant and the turn on is identical in both problems. Meaning G minus GC to a power is what the, re the resistivity seems to turn on like as you go through the, the transition to the metallic phase. Has anyone tried this with disorder as a scaling parameter rather than the field? Yeah, I mean, th the original data by Goldman is all thickness tuned. Okay, it's just that it's easier with these films to, to, to do it with a magnetic field. The fabrication is just harder, or at least, uh, well, Art can talk about this. <laughs> transition, we saw the resistance go way up, right? and the Hall constant was zero, and then the Hall constant turned on as the resistance was coming way back down. That's so why I asked the question. you measured the Hall constant yeah, in the your Hall early data? Yeah, 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 it's there. There's a crossover at a higher field than uh, the crossover where it goes into the very high resistance okay. state. You were not here when I showed your data. Oh, um. Um, yeah, I, I did walk in late, but... Uh, 
data That's should good. still be what I'm telling you. Right, okay. No, that's Goldman's data. Yeah, no, I here's the, yours. <laughs> no, but I want the field swept data. The, the, okay, the, okay. The so R we, versus B. R versus B. Yeah, there are two crossovers. One is where the resistance goes up to infinity, mm -hmm. and then there are RXY turns on from zero at a higher okay. field. So okay. the resistance is coming down. That, I that's, see. And that's what we see. I see. Okay, so, so would you agree with Aaron that... I would, I, Aaron looks like he's in agreement with me, yeah. Okay, sorry, it's okay, okay, okay. Okay, so what's interesting, okay, I don't know if you've seen this paper, but Aaron is claiming to be the first to have measured. No, it's right in our paper, <laughs> and it's in that same paper, the next figure. Okay, okay, yeah. so you would say this is, not a, so this is not a new conclusion? I would say that uh, we saw a different crossover when the RXY turned on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's why I asked you whether it was smaller. Oh, okay. oh, I yeah. see. Yeah. Okay, right, right, right. Now, now I get yeah. the nature. Of it comes back down and look. Uh, I, I, in my opinion, um, there is no new data in this problem. <laughs> I mean, it was all there in yours and Goldman's. I mean, all of this stuff was there in in the '80s and the '90s. And it's just that because of the dominance of this and who proposed this phase-only model. It has taken a while for people to realize that if there is a metallic phase, then we have to rethink a lot of things. And I think that's still not going on. So, you know. I never thought of it as an analysis. I just thought of it as an insulator of But it can't be an insulator if the resistivity isn't diverging. The well, well. Okay. Not in. Okay, let me just go through. Okay, so this right here. Okay, so here's all of the data. Okay, so, oh crap. Okay, so 2016 to 1989, nothing has changed. When you start in increasing the field, or the, 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 the uh, or decreasing the thickness, the resistivity plateaus. Okay, then that's uh, now you didn't actually see a plateau. Well, I'm talking about mechanics and all of the Okay, 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 okay. What I'm saying is that this behavior of the leveling off of rho xx is what is interpreted as the a a metallic. Yeah, okay, okay. You didn't see that. Yeah, I know, indium oxide was sort of funny, but actually in Capitolics... Right, right, right. Okay, so did you ever see, okay, so in, in your data, did you never saw an indium oxide leveling off of the resistance? Okay, so if you look at the Capitolic data right here, yeah, I know, I know, we're ready to go. Okay, fine. This is indium oxide. A and you see a leveling off of the resistivity. No, it's, this, this is 2017 indium oxide. 